right now it starts to really get fun because we're going to try and get those sprites that we added in the last video, the ball and the foot, to be animated um, by an animation timer. So moving on their own. Uh, to give you an idea, this is kind of how I want things to be able to work. And a lot of times this is how I write code. I just write what I want it to be able to do and then figure out how to make that work. So um, what I want is to have a public void uh, update game. And update game will take a certain amount of time, elapsed time, which will be a double, because again, it might be quarter second, actually hopefully less, like a hundredth of a second. And when I get that elapsed time, I'm going to um, ask for the ball physics to be done based on that amount of time. Now, I'm not just writing the code straight up here in this method. It seems a little bit weird to have one method just call another method. I'm not writing it here because, number one, the ball physics takes a little bit of work. By the time we're done the game, there'll be about 30, 35 lines there. So I want that to be an, of its own thing. And the second reason is there's a few other things to do in the game update, not just move the ball around. Like there'll be the keyboard input for the foot. And so I'll have some other method calls here in the update game. But the idea is I want to have something call this update game, which will have the ball physics go and then have the keyboard input and have all the other stuff taken care of. And that will move stuff. And when I, every time I call this method, things will get moved around the screen. So, okay, here's my ball physics game method, public void uh, ball physics. And it takes as an argument elapsed time as well. And what happens when I say, okay, I want to do some physics with the ball uh, based off of a tenth of a second of time passed since the last update? Well, I'm going to have the ball... And remember, I already wrote a method in the sprite class to handle this. I'm going to say to the ball, okay, just please do an update based on uh, how much time has passed. Now, I'm going to be adding to this, but that's sort of the basics of it. I just want the ball to update, which moves the ball based on how much time has gone by. Now, before I get into the animation timer, if I just created a button for this for now, let's just make a button... Uh, and we'll just call it time because it'll represent the passage of a little bit of time, which is a new button. And time set on action. So when an event occurs, I want the game to get updated. So update game. And let's say that that's a, a tenth of a second will have passed every time I push the button. Right. And I'm going to add that button onto the screen. All right, so if I run that, okay, there's my ball, there's my uh, shoe, sprites, and every time I click the button right now, it's going to act like one tenth of a second has passed. Okay, nothing's happening. Why did nothing happen? Because the ball doesn't have any velocity, it's not moving. So I need to add some velocity to it in the constructor to have uh, some initial velocity. Uh, let's see. So I want to set my velocity. And right now, let's just set some Y direction velocity. Uh, let's say it's going to move maybe uh, 100 pixels per second down the form. Positive is down the form or down the window. Sorry. So it's going to go at 100 and it, that's measured in pixels per second. Right. So when I say one tenth of a second has gone by, it should move 10 pixels down the screen. And then the next time I say one tenth of a second has gone by, I move another 10 pixels down the screen. All right, okay, let's run that again. And so every time I click the button, a tenth of a second has passed. So there goes the ball moving 10 pixels down the screen every time I click the button, which you can sort of see how you get the idea of some animation. Now it's going to go past the end. It's never coming back. But you see how you get some idea of some animation. We don't want to have to have a button click happen all the time for that ball to move. We want to have some kind of automatic updates that move the ball on their own. 
Okay, I'm going to leave the button for now and, and show you why in a minute. But what JavaFX provides in order for automatic updates is a class called an animation timer. And so I'm going to make a private game timer that is, uh, sorry, private animation timer is the class. Game timer is going to be the name of the variable. <clears throat> And I'm just going to do that. I need to import animation timer. Okay, so I, I didn't make the new animation timer object on, here on line 21 because it's not quite going to work. I'll show you here in the constructor. I have to build, I have to make the object here in the constructor, and I'll show you why. So if I go game timer and I say it's equal to a new animation timer, and I just do that, I get an error. Uh-oh, what's that error? And if I look at the error, it says cannot instantiate the type animation timer. Why can't I make an instance or make an object of the type animation timer? Well, animation timer includes one method that's called handle that essentially is the event uh, that occurs and and you get to do whatever you want with that event every time that event occurs but you have to code what the handle method does and until you code what the handle method does you're not allowed to make an instance of that object you're not allowed to make an object variable and how we code how that works is we put new animation timer like we're making an instance of the object, just like any other normal object. But then we put a set of brace brackets. <clears throat> and within the brace brackets, we have to include the method public void handle. And handle takes an argument, which is a long variable. Long is a type of integer, but a wider range of numbers. And that's the current time on the computer. Uh, the current time in this case is being measured in nanoseconds uh, from some point in time back in the 1990s, I think. Like it's a it's a strange metric that they use. But what it allows us to do is pick up the current system time and then sort of decide how much time has passed since the last time we looked at the current system time. All right, so once I have that public handle method, <coughs> you can see now that my error is gone for the game timer. Um, that's not everything I want to do with the animation timer. I'm actually going to add a couple of things into the animation timer here as part of the, the handle method. There's a couple other methods that the timer provides that I want to um, add some code to as well. So one is public void start. What do you do when you start the timer? And the third one is public void stop. What happens when you stop the timer? Now, JavaFX has those two implemented. Start just starts the timer, and it starts calling the handle event as often as it can. And stop just stops the timer. But I want to track something a little bit extra above just starting and stopping the timer and having a handle event go. One of the things that I need to track, the most important thing I need to track, is what was the time last time the timer went off. So I'm going to call that previous time. Because if I want to calculate how much time has passed between now and the last time the timer went off, well, I need to know what time the last time was. And then to find out how much has elapsed, I just subtract those two values. Right now, I'm going to start with a previous time is a long I'm going to start with that being equal to negative one. And the reason I'm going to use negative one is like that's not a valid time. The times that you get from the current time uh, value that gets passed to handle would be a large number, something in the billions. 
So it doesn't make sense to have negative one. What I'm going to use that as a flag for sort of within my computer or within my program is that the timer is not running. If I look at previous time and the time is negative one, the timer itself is not going. And so the first thing I want to do when the timer starts is catch what is the time when the timer got started. Right? And so to do that, I'm going to go previous time is equal to what's the actual current time on the system. And you can get that yourself by going system.nanotime. Let me get out the capital T. Yeah, there we go. System.nanotime tells me what's the time on the system. And that's the same value that gets passed as the current time to the handle method. Right now, I also need to make sure that the actual animation timer gets started. And so not this timer, but I need to call the start um, method for the animation timer, not this new one that I'm sort of creating here. And so I have to say super dot start. That calls the original start method to do whatever it does. I don't know how it works, but it does what it does and starts the timer in the JavaFX platform. Similarly, when I stop the timer, that's when I want to go back to uh, the previous time being equal to negative one. So my flag again, timer is not running, and stop the timer. So super dot stop. Okay, that just leaves. Oh, what do I do every time the handle method gets called? JavaFX calls the handle method and triggers that itself. But what should my program do every time I get this message from JavaFX? Handle, 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 handle. It's going to call that as often as it can. Well, I need to do three things. I need to figure out how much time has gone by, calculate the elapsed time. This is where I'm going to do that part. Call the update method. now that I know how much time has passed. And then I have to remember what time it is now for the next time. Uh, okay, so call the update game method. Well, I'm just going to call update game and tell it some time has passed, elapsed time. I'm going to calculate that in one second. And to save the current time, well, I'm going to look, take the previous time erase what is currently the previous time and set it equal to the time now so that next time handle gets called i'll have that time stored and i can calculate with it and the calculation i want to do with it lets me calculate what is the elapsed time the elapsed time is the difference between now the current time and what was the time last time and so if I subtract those two, I find out how many nanoseconds has passed since the last time this event got called. I don't measuring things in nanoseconds is challenging uh, because the numbers are really huge. And it also just hurts my brain to think about measuring in nanoseconds. So I want to convert this time in nanoseconds into seconds. How much time in seconds has passed? And then I can do things like, say, the speed of the ball is 100 pixels per second and calculate it accurately. To convert from nanoseconds to seconds, I need to divide the number of nanoseconds by 1 billion. That's a 1 with 9 zeros. 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And to make sure that the answer to this calculation is a double number, not a long I need to put a point zero on that. And so that's going to calculate in seconds how much time has gone by since the last time the handle event was triggered. It's going to update the game and it's going to save the time for the next time. And when it updates the game, it's going to pass time in seconds, which is exactly what I wanted it to do. Okay, now if I ran this right now, the you wouldn't see the game updates happening 
because the timer is not turned on to begin with. And what I've found sort of through experience is you don't want the timer turned on immediately in a JavaFX program because what will happen is it takes about, I don't know what, a quarter second to pop the window up on screen. And if you have the timer running during that quarter second, the first amount of elapsed time between uh, when the program starts and when you get an update uh, game event happen, that elapsed time will be too long and the game will really jump in the first frame and things will be very inaccurate and hard to measure. So what you want to do is you want to get the program loaded all the way, have the player ready to go. Uh, they do something like press the space bar to start the game or whatever it is they're going to do. And then the timer gets turned on. So that's why I held on to the button for a second here in the program. Eventually, we're going to change it over to press the space bar to start. But for now, let's change this button so that it says go. And when the person hits the go button, I don't want to update the game myself. I want to actually turn my timer on. So I'll take my game timer, which is the name of my timer object, and I will go dot start. And so when I press the button, the game timer will start and the ball will animate itself. Let's take a look at that. Assuming I did everything right, I hit go. And there goes the ball. And you can see that the game timing is pretty smooth. All right, in the next video, we'll start doing a little bit of the interaction between those two sprites, the foot and the ball, so that the ball will drop down the screen, bounce up off the foot, go back up, and then come back down and bounce off the foot again, and we'll get some of the game mechanics going. So we'll start adding to the ball physics to make the animation at least slightly more interesting. Not quite the game yet, but we're getting there.